So last time, uh, we looked at uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric wave functions. We saw how that gives rise to two different uh, kinds of particles. Uh, one is fermions, the other one is uh, bosons. And they have um, Even though there's only like one thing that really uh, is the difference between them, it is that with fermions, uh, they cannot occupy the same space, so they are the same quantum numbers. So they accommodate on top of each other, that's their minimum energy state. And bosons can all fall to the same lowest energy orbital. That's pretty much the only difference between them but it produces a pretty striking um, phenomena in the universe, for example, uh, volume, which is kind of a big thing. So we saw that leptons and quarks are fermions. When you combine uh, particles, their spins are going to align or anti-align so if they have at the end uh, integral spin, they're bosons. If they have half integer, then they're fermions. And bosons, uh, well, all force carriers, so gluons and W and Z and all that stuff, they are bosons uh, and protons. Of course. So now we're going to derive their statistics. So we um, start with our typical diagram. This is the reservoir, and this is the system. And this is going to be for a uh, for fermions. So how many states, how many orbitals should we put over here in the system? Let's put a single one. So the system. Script S has a single orbital. What are the options? What are the possibilities for a fermion occupying this orbital? How many can we put in there? Can we put zero? Is it just one? Just one. One or zero, right? Zero or one. So it can be unoccupied, that's fine. We can put one, that's fine. We cannot put more than one. That'll be against the all the uh, exclusion principle. So if the if S has zero fermion um, particles, well, they are fermions. If S has zero fermions, then the energy is going to be zero. And so the reservoir is going to have Um, and not. Now we need a not in here to make a distinction that this is the total number of particles, as opposed to just you know n. And you know some 
energy um, u not. And it's going to have some multiplicity and it's going to have some entropy. If the system has one fermion, then the energy is going to be E. Energy. And so R is going to have N minus one particle and U not minus epsilon um, energy. So, you know, before we had uh, all kinds of particles over here, now it is more specific. Uh, so this is a, this reservoir only has fermions. And so that means that uh, it needs to have enough orbitals to accommodate those fermions. Um, which is okay. Actually, we can consider a system, um, you know, um, like a more realistic system, maybe like an atom or something, and say that focus on one of the electrons and say that that is the system and the rest of the, um, of the realistic system, you know, a metal, a solid, is going to be the reservoir. And actually, we already solved this problem. Uh, we did it with the case of the myo myoglobin, in which the myoglobin could um, trap or uh, absorb one atom of um, one molecule of oxygen. Okay, so what we can do next is to get the Gibbs free uh, Gibson and remember that if we get Gibson we can get everything else from the other thermodynamic variables. So the definition is all states and numbers of lambda n um, exponent or e to the over tau. So this system has so few states that we can enumerate them. Um, so either the options are n equals one, um, zero, energy equals zero, and n equals one, energy equals well, energy. Those are the only two states. So these keeps energy zero e to the minus zero over tau lambda to the one e to the minus over tau. And you can still see that, yeah. So this is just um, one is lambda e to the minus e over tau the same expression that we derived before for the myoglobin system. Uh, what we shown before also is that expansion value of the number of particles you know, in there is um, lambda derivative of the natural log uh, gives sum with respect to lambda. So we can take the 
lambda out of, I'm gonna give some out of here. And this will be just, the derivative of the gibson with respect to lambda. So we can carry that on. If we don't need this anymore. over the gypsum derivative with respect to lambda of one plus lambda e to the minus e over tau so this one is zero this one is going to be just um, e to the minus e over tau so lambda and then we still have the gibson over here so that is one plus lambda e to the minus e over tau and here we're just repeating the same procedure as in the previous problem so we can divide this one by lambda e to the minus e over tau and this whole thing by the same and they're all getting small so then on top we just have one in the bottom we have lambda to the negative one e to the positive e over tau uh, plus one and what is uh what is lambda the potential of e to the potential over Right. So, um, it's negative. All right. Yes. So this is lambda, the activation. The inverse of the activation is here. So we we'll put it over here. E to the minus activation over tau. So we can rewrite that as e to the e minus mu energy minus the chemical potential divided by tau plus one. Okay, so this is the expectation value of the number of particles, but when it is in this form, when it represents this distribution, it's usually um, called F. So F is a function of the energy. And you, know, you have a different curve for each potential and temperature. So, um if you don't want to if you if you want to be more explicit you can put an f and d over here for fermi dirac so these baby over here is the fermi dirac distribution function.
Yes? Yes. Okay. My microphone did something weird. So this is equation, uh, Kittel and Cromer 6.4. Okay. Um, this distribution is extremely important. And we will see um, in the next few weeks and months why. So in the context of solid state physics, this mu, or mu depends on the temperature, uh, tau. This is called the Fermi level. Um, I don't know if you have heard that term before, maybe in your research. Um, if the temperature is zero, so then there'll be just mu of zero. In that case, it's called the Fermi energy. Have you guys heard about the Fermi energy before, or the Fermi level? No? No, I haven't. Mm, what about the people who are doing research um, you know, with like Tuna or Sope or Peterson? No? OK. Um, well, it's kind of a big thing. So there is another way to write the uh, Fermi direct distribution, which you might find useful, uh, is with the with the hyperbolic tangent. So tang. X is e to the two x minus one divided by e to the two x one. So and this. So this is going to be well, a bit over here. e to the 2x e plus 1 divided by e to the 2x plus 1. So the e's go away and you just have these two on top. Half of one minus tang x is equal, is equal to this times one half. So we can get rid of the twos. We have down here. So we want two x to be equal to e minus mu over so then x and so the One half of one minus tang of 
of p minus mu Why is this easier to manipulate or might be easier? Because we know what are the derivatives. Integrals. Um, okay, so. How does the tang function um, look like? Anyone remembers? Zero receives one. And this is minus one. So it's going to look like that. Uh, so here we the negative. So we're flipping it. Uh, we have the one. We're shifting it. And we have the one half. So the Fermi Dirac is going to look like that. So this is the inflationary potential constant, right? Yes. So if the temperature changes, and we're going to see that the distribution is going to, to change, right? Well, the, the shape of the distribution. So we have tang. of this strange distribution. I'm gonna put it over here. Uh, So first thing that we're going to look at is what happens if uh, epsilon, the energy, is equal to mu. Well, in that case, Is going to be one over e to the what? Zero. Oh, yeah. Zero. Uh, the whole thing is one half. It's two. So this one. one two. Right. So one half. So then this term is equal to one, one plus, plus one, two. Okay. So the occupancy, if you have an orbital that has the Fermi level, that is at the Fermi level, then um, the occupation it has to be one half. It's independent of the temperature. 
Okay, first, that, that is our first observation. Um, and I tried to draw that over here, right? So this is one half. So if you change the temperature, uh, the shape is going to change, but it always has to be one half at zero or at, you know, at new. Okay, so if the energy is less than mu, then it's going to be um, a negative, and I'm, I'm going to represent it as negative x. E is less than mu, so uh, we have a, a negative over here. It still depends on the temperature, plus one. So in the low temperature limit, in the low temperature limit, tau will go to zero. So then we have one over e to the x over tau. Uh, this goes to zero. So this becomes really big, infinity in fact. So this becomes zero. And this is just one. Okay. In the low temperature limit, the occupancy is one below the Fermi level. And you know, we can kind of see that over here, it goes to one. If the energy is greater than the chemical potential, then we have uh, e to the x over tau plus one. So in the low temperature limit, this is going to be you know, close to zero. So this is close to infinity. So this is infinity. So the occupation is zero. Okay. So now we can draw um, a diagram of how this thing looks definitely in the low temperature limit. So we're gonna have, I'm gonna put mu over here. The maximum value is one. The minimum value is zero. We have one half over here. This is the Fermi Dirac distribution. It's going to look like this. If you are below the Fermi level, the probability that the state is occupied is one. If you're above the Fermi level, the probability that that state is occupied is zero. If you increase the temperature, then it will start to look a little bit like this, like the tang. And so it has to go through one half. And you know, you're gonna have generally a conservation of particles, so maybe it can look a little bit like that. It means that this one's gonna look a little bit like this. If the temperature is like ridiculously high, you know, then maybe it can look like this, All right? So, 
I don't have color over here, but this one is now equal zero. Of course, you cannot reach zero, but it's going to be very close to that. Uh, this one over here, greater than zero. And this one over here is now much greater than zero. That's how the Fermi direct distribution looks like. And that is how it behaves with temperature. Any questions about that? Not yet. Let's repeat the same procedure, but let's do it for bosons. We have the same reservoir. Well, not the same different reservoir, right? A reservoir. We have a system. How many, uh, you know, we have one orbital in the system. How many bosons can we put in there? Is it as many as we want? Yeah, up to infinity. So if the system has one boson, let's say zero bosons, then the energy is going to be um, zero. If the system has one boson, then the energy is going to be E which is the energy of this orbital. If it has two bosons, then the energy is going to be 2e, and so on. If it has n bosons, the energy is n times e. You can put as many as you want. So I guess I forgot to mention this in the the figure for the Fermi Dirac distribution is uh, figure 6.3 in Kittel and Cromer. Okay. Yes. What about like, for fermions, for example, helium? Does, does a helium has two fermions in one, I mean, two electrons in one orbit? Um, so the, the, the simpler case with helium, will be to just focus on, on the nucleus at the beginning, right? So there are two isotopes of helium. There's helium-3 and helium-4. So helium-3 is going to have two protons and one neutron. Helium-4 is going to have two protons and two neutrons. So what is the spin of protons? One half. So the two protons are going to cancel out their spins, and you have an unpaired neutron spin. So helium-3 it's a fermion. What about here? So this is a boson. Uh, helium-4 has, uh, it's a superfluid. If you cool it down, uh, you know, 
to a temperature that is low enough, uh, there's going to be no cost for, for, for atoms just moving through this fluid, through this liquid. That doesn't happen with helium-3 because helium-3 is a fermion. So uh, the uh, particles cannot be in the same energy state. The bosons can. So it all depends. You know, if you add the electrons in there, um, you're going to have, if they're neutral, they have two electrons. The two electrons are going to, to uh, spin up and spin down, so they're not going to contribute. So uh, that helium-3, the atom, helium-4, it's a boson. This is, uh, this is pretty interesting stuff. The, the properties of helium-3 and helium-4 are completely different. So basically, the means of like combinations of the other ones, when you talk about the Size you always combine them. So yeah, depends on on what you have. Okay, so let's do this one. Um, so figure six point five. It looks a little bit like this. N equals zero. Uh, has no energy. And then N equals one has energy E. N equals two has energy two E and so on. That's figure 6.5. Okay, so we do the same thing as before. We're gonna go through, we're gonna get the Gibbs sum. So the definition, sum over all states and numbers. Um, there is only one state per particle, right? So um, each n has an energy associated with it. And so that means that we can rewrite sum is going to depend only on the on the number of particles. It's going to be the sum from n equals zero to infinity. Then we have lambda of n minus E s uh, divided by tau. And in this equation uh, six point seven. So we can take, wait, I'm missing something. Oh, yes. And that is the, um, the NE over here. OK, so now we can just take the ends out of there. N equals zero n sum from n equals zero to infinity of lambda e to the minus. Um, I guess we don't need the s anymore because it's specified here. So e over tau. Everything is to the n. Oh, we have the yes. So this one is equation uh, also 6.7. So 
if we let x e to the minus e over tau, then we can rewrite the keep sum as the sum from n equals zero to infinity x to the n. Have you seen that before? The metric series, right? So the solution is one over one minus x. Uh, if and only if x is smaller or less than one. If x is less than one, then you are adding powers of a fraction. And so uh, it is bound. But if x is greater than one, then this is unbound, it just goes to infinity. Okay, so um, when can I, I guess I can rewrite it down there. So the gypsum, can you still see this? Yeah, right? Yes. Uh, the gypsum is, I feel like I need more space. One over, actually I'm just gonna do the inverse to save space. One minus lambda, e to the minus e over tau, inverse of that. All right, so this is our Gibbs sum. That Gibbs sum is equation 6.8. So now we get the expectation value of the number of particles. We said it before, it's just uh, lambda over the partition function um, times the derivative, sorry, not the partition, the Gibbs sum, derivative of the Gibbs sum with respect to lambda. So it's going to be lambda over Gibbs sum derivative with respect to lambda of that. Right, so it'll be lambda gypsum um, minus, is that right? Um, one minus lambda e to the minus e over tau to the negative two. minus e exponent of minus e to the tau. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, this um, well, I'm going to write it as lambda 
the two negatives cancel out. So lambda e minus e to the tau divided by um, one minus lambda. Yeah, squared. Then we have the skip sum over here, which is a an inverse. So we can put it up here. One minus lambda. Like that. And so this one cancels cancels out with this one. And we can do the previous trick as before. So just divide by lambda e to the minus e over tau on both sides. And we end up with, uh, now I'm gonna call this a fraction or um, occupation. And I'm gonna call this the Bose-Einstein. This is the Bose-Einstein distribution. Um, one over mm, lambda to the negative one e to the e. You can put it on top as positive minus one. And just like we did before with the lambda, so this is going to be e to the e minus mu divided by tau minus one. Okay. So we have this baby over here. This is the Bose Einstein. distribution function. Okay, it is equation 6.10. What is the difference between the Fermi Dirac and the Bose Einstein distribution distributions? If you just look at the at the actual functional forms, the actual equations, what is the difference? The sign over here. So Fermi Dirac is plus one. Bose Einstein is minus one. That is the whole difference between bosons and fermions. So there is, you know, this is just a decaying exponential, but there is one constraint that it has. We said that over here in the in the geometric series. It has to be less than one. So x is this, so lambda e minus e over tau uh, has to be less than one. So uh, e to the minus e over tau is less than uh, inverse lambda, then this will be e to the minus mu divided by tau. 
can take the natural log from both sides. So, over the town is less than mu negative. You can get rid of the negatives and the town. So, oh, wait, wait. I did something weird here. Um, so these ones are both inverse, so we can put them on the other side as not inverse. So mu over tau, e over tau. And now we do the natural log thing. We get mu over tau is less than e over tau. So mu is less than e, I guess a more normal, more intuitive way. E is less than, it's greater than the chemical potential. So distribution is going to look We have mu over here. This goes to infinity as the energy gets arbitrarily close to mu. So it's going to look kind of like that. And then you know, after that, it is just a um, exponential. And in the high temperature limit, Fermi Dirac is going to look like this. All right. So this is Bose Einstein, and this is Fermi Dirac. So if you are close, if the energy is close to the chemical potential, so if the energy is low, the difference between bosons and fermions is huge, it's humongous. Over here, they have the same behavior. But we will see that even though it's called the classical limit, it actually uh, has the H bar in there. So it is, a, it is a quantum property. Okay, so this is figure 6.6. .6. All right, so we know both Einstein, we know Fermi Dirac. We know that in the classical limit, they have very similar behavior. Well, let's take a look at the classical limit. Um, so in the classical limit, we see that Fermi Dirac is approximately equal to Bose Einstein. So one over E E minus mu over tau plus one is approximately equal 
minus one over e to the e minus mu over tau minus one. This is going to be true when this term, the exponential, is much greater than than one. So we want e to the minus mu over tau much greater than one. So we can take the natural log on both sides. And then this means that e minus mu over tau is much greater than zero. So that means that the t we can put it over here, doesn't matter. Um, this one is negative, we can put it on the other side, adding. So the condition for uh, to be in the classical limit is that the energy is much greater than the chemical potential. So um, we can call this one the classical. just for fun. So that classical, the distribution in the classical limit is one over uh, over tau. So, um, that is equal to e to the mu minus the energy over tau. So we're putting it on top, so we switch things. And this uh, mu divided by tau is the activation. So okay. So this is the distribution in the classical limit. That is equation 6.13. So um, we can study a few things about this distribution. For example, Let's look at the chemical potential. The total number of particles is equal to the sum over um, all the states of this uh, distribution, right? So we're just integrating. So then this is going to be equal to the sum of uh, lambda e to the minus es over tau. And 
Do you recognize this guy over here? We can make it more transparent. This is Lambda. So, Yeah, that was the prediction function of um, the one particle ideal gas. So that's pretty cool. That is equation 6.15. So uh, remember that the partition function Z1 was the quantum concentration uh, times the volume. And the quantum concentration is mass to the three halves. Right, so you have your quant your H bar in there. So even in the classical limit, um, the chemical potential the chemical potential is um, a quantum quantity. So then we have uh, a number of particles is lambda. Uh, Q divided by V um, so lambda the activation is um, n divided by V and um, divided by n Q. And this N over V is just a regular concentration. So the activation is regular concentration divided by quantum concentration. And the activation is E to the mu over tau. So we can take a natural log natural logs, this is um, mu over tau equals natural log of n over n. So we can put the tau over here to get the chemical potential. Does that look familiar? What is it? So this is equation 6.18, but it's also equation 5.12a. This is the chemical potential of an ideal gas, classical ideal gas. Uh, so before we got the free energy, we we had to make a um, a correction with the n factorial to ensure that we were considering indistinguishable particles, um, and we got and we got this. But over here we get it directly, and we make no assumptions because um, with the Gibbs some, it is already you know, inherently included in there. So 
you know, this is the limit, the high, uh, the, the classical limit of both the Fermi Dirac and the Bose Einstein distributions. So what it means is that in the in the classical limit, so your the occupation of the orbitals is really low, and the volume is high, the concentration is low, the temperature is high. In the classical limit, it doesn't matter if your particle is a fermion or a boson. Let's say that you have helium-3 and helium-4. In the classical limit, the dilute limit, they are just going to interact as a, as, a, as an ideal gas. You have to decrease the temperature a lot in order to get to the quantum regime. And in the quantum regime, these two will behave very differently. At high temperature, yeah, you probably have both of them in your balloon. Okay, so um, I'm going to get now the the free energy. And again, using the distributions. So the definition of free energy, the derivative of the free energy with respect to the number of particles at constant temperature and volume is the chemical potential. We have the chemical potential over here. So it's going to be tau natural log of n over nq. And um, then we have um, yeah, I can put everything here. We have um, this derivative, so we're going to put the dn over here and integrate. So we get integral of um, mu dn. So this mu over here. So that is going to be equal to. Tau, which is multiplying everything, integral of the natural log of n, the n minus integral of the natural log. I need more space here. Of uh, the volume and n q. So I separated this n, you know, it was summing over here to get the small n, take it out, and now we have the negative. So these were uh, divided, dividing before the volume and the quantum concentration, the n. So this is equal to tau, the, this integral is n, natural log of n minus n. And this one is going to be minus n, because this stuff doesn't depend on the number of particles, natural log of b and q. So we can take out the n, so n tau. Um, natural log of n. And now I, this one is subtracting, so now I can put it down here. B and Q uh, minus one. So we have this n over here. And so this is equal to n tau 
natural log of concentration divided by quantum concentration minus one. So that it's a free energy of an ideal gas. This is equation um, 6.24. And because we have two more minutes, why not? We can get the pressure. So the definition of pressure is minus uh, pressure. Um, derivative, well, I'm going to put it over here, derivative, the free energy um, with respect to the volume. Constant N and tau. So we have the free energy over here. And Actually, only this part over here uh, depends on the volume. So it's going to be so now I separated the V and the and the. Uh, some concentration. So the derivative of this the volume derivative with respect to the volume of this whole thing negative. So that's going to be in tau derivative with respect to the volume of the only term that has the volume. And you have one negative over here and this negative. So it becomes positive. So the derivative of the natural log of V with respect to V is just one over V. So this is N, this is the pressure. N tau over V. And we get that PV equals to NP, which of course is the uh, ideal gas relationship. This one is 6.29. So this is a cool chapter because you know, it's called um, ideal gas. And we are deriving everything that we had already done for the ideal gas, free energy, the pressure, the chemical potential. But we are doing it from the most uh, fundamental um, quantities possible, which are the Fermi Dirac and the Bose Einstein distributions. And we just say, okay, in the classical limit, we observe all the properties of classical ideal gases. So and this is, I think, uh, pretty cool. You know, it's, it's almost an axiomatic derivation of thermodynamics. All right, so I'm going to stop recording over here.